Welcome to this edition of the Native News Update on this Wednesday, September 15th. I'm your host for today's program, Paul Domain. Many of the stories read right here can also be found at our website at IndianCountryNews.com. And here's uh, the news stories for the day and some more video clips from Indian Summer and other programs. Researchers in southern Arkansas are holding out hope that they'll somehow recover more than two dozen pieces of Caddo Indian pottery that were stolen four years ago. The 26 pots, bowls, and bottles are likely taken uh, in May or June of the year 2006, a theft that Southern Arkansas University archaeologist Jamie Brandon discovered in his fourth day on the job. University police and the FBI have investigated, but their work hasn't led them to a suspect. Brandon told the Banner News in Magnolia the pots had been extensively photographed and documented, which would make it hard to move the items on the any kind of a legitimate market. The pots were found in a dig in 1980 from the Cedar Grove site in Lafayette County there. They were being stored at SAU, but there were plans to return them to the Cotto tribe of Oklahoma. The chief of Maine's Penobscot Indian Nation is going to serve a second four-year term. The Bangor Daily News says that Chief Kirk Francis was re-elected last Saturday, easily beating his challenger, former Chief Barry Dana. The 41-year-old Francis of Pasadum Kieg says he's gratified by the outcome of the voting. Francis says his re-election is an endorsement of his policies, which have resulted in a number of economic development opportunities, including contracts with the U.S. Department of Defense and a wind energy program. Dana's campaign had stressed a return to tribal governance and a traditional lifestyle. Francis says he'll focus his second term on more economic development projects. The nine members of the Tribal Council of the Lac View Desert Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa, and Watersmeet, Michigan, who were jailed last week in a dispute over the election of new members, have been released. The Daily Globe of Ironwood, Ironwood, Michigan reports that the consul was freed this weekend after a tribal appellate court decision. The consul was arrested on September 8th by an order of Judge Bradley Dakota of the Keweenaw Bay Indian community who ordered the consul held until a majority agreed to swear in the new executive consul. The tribal consul refused. Consul lawyer Zeke uh, Fletcher says the appellate court issued a stay of Dakota's contempt of court order. Consul members have said they were being punished for upholding the tribe's constitution. Waters meat is located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Although scientists tend to cringe when uh, you use terms such as treasure trove, and when they are applied to archaeological sites, it's hard to describe the uh, Finch site at Highway 26 north of Milton, Wisconsin, in any other way. What else would you call a two-acre strip of wooded hills that archaeologists says 100, holds 160 identified pits where prehistoric Native American people dumped everything from deer bones to weapon shards to burnt and broken clay cookware? What do you call a property that contains, at the very minimum, 100,000 Native American artifacts which scientists believe date from 5,000 B.C. to 1,000 to an A.D.? The Finch site, which is located northeast of the intersection of Highway 26 and Pond Road in the Koshkening Township of Wisconsin, will soon... Uh, will soon be buried by a state highway. Archaeologists who have been digging at the site since late last year have nearly wrapped up a contract work for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. They're charged to excavate 25% of the site and identify its contents before the state purchases and paves over most of it with the planned Highway 26 expansion in the year 2013. Although 75% of the site remains untouched, the Wisconsin DOT has known since conducting an archaeological survey in 1999 that the area holds a significant amount of native artifacts. And today we go to an abbreviated short ride of the Indian Summer Festival Midway Grounds and watch the IndianCountryTV.com library for more of these video clips that are being posted each day. And after that we go to a Mark Trahunt update with a short report on primary elections on Tuesday, September 14th. Summerfest, so we're on the midway, aren't we? We're looking at people walking around. There's the Potawatomi bingo stage. 
And there's someone performing over on that side. I think that's, uh, oh, that's Gabriel or whatever. He's doing his contemporary music over there. There is the traditional Iroquois village down here, I believe. There's the longhouse. I think you can see that in the distance over there. Let's focus in on that a little bit. Oh, yeah, there it is. Let me go by. Uh, what are they saying? Beautiful waterfront today here. Beautiful weather at Indian Summer. Man, people eating food, buying t-shirts. There's the Oneida Village. There's a longhouse down there. Who do we see down there? My mom. There. Oh, there's Mr. Benton, Edward Benton Benet and Karen DeMaine. And they're waving at us. Look at that, look at that. He's helping us along, all right. It's Winnebuzo! All right, that's cool. And we're following these people. We just don't seem to be catching up on. And here's people coming back the other way, but these are empty. Now, okay, we're going over down on the midway and they got all the food. It says grilled cheese sandwiches down there. Wisconsin do mini donuts. Mini donuts, okay. What's that one say over there? Uh, kettle corn. You like kettle corn? Yes, I do. Is that your favorite stuff? Yes. All right. And here is one of the nicest playgrounds that kids can find. When you need a little break, you come over here and you'll never get back on the midway if you got kids like mine because they just love that playground stuff. Yesterday was a primary day in several states, and we get a little bit of a political roundup perspective from Shoshone Bannock tribal member Mark Trahant, and watch for our updated reports of Native candidates and issues as we move on to the November 2nd general elections right here on IndianCountryTV.com. Uh, Mark Trahant, uh, another primary day in the United States is out of the way uh, amongst many states in many providences and all those kinds of things. A couple of weeks ago, Arizona had a primary and Chris Deshay uh, won for Secretary of State, one of the, the second highest office in Arizona. He's now running as a Democrat. We have a had an election here in Sawyer County in which the local reservation holds the balance of power between any candidate uh, running when people don't necessarily identify with the Republicans or Democrats and go down the middle. They can vote either or the sheriff's race on the Republican ballot. Uh, one of the candidates won by about a 400 vote margin out of 3,500 votes cast, which means that the balance of power resides out on the reservation with tribal voters. Um, they endorsed a candidate who won. There has to be some other successes across Indian country. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Well, like you mentioned, Chris Destiny in Arizona, which is huge. Uh, another one is Diane Beeson, uh, who's the lieutenant governor uh, nominee for the Democratic Party in uh, Alaska. Uh, both of those should bring out Native voters, and uh, that, I think, will augur well for the fall. Uh, I think we've heard a lot about how um, bad it's going to be for the Democrats in uh, November, and certainly, historically, that's been a problem in off-cycle elections. But I think a couple of facts that um, kind of uh, break that is you have the potential for a good ground game, which is meaning getting your voters out that could have some sort of mitigating force. Uh, indeed, getting the voters out is interesting because typically a primary vote sometimes, you know, is 8 or 9 percent, depending on what's going on. I think like in this county, we had uh, close to at least uh, 40 or 50, maybe better in the final analysis voter turnout uh, it used to be difficult to turn native voters out just in the general primary let alone right. the local elections and primaries but they are uh, we've been registering them in the last decade uh, in mass and that uh, process continues what do you see uh, you see some connection between what happens with the republicans and democrats winning uh, the senate or the house in the upcoming elections what configuration changes are you seeing well, the big one last night is I see uh, it very difficult for the Republicans to take control of the Senate now. Um, they would have to have an unbelievable run to make that happen. Um, 
the Democrats basically have um, 44 seats where they're safe or leading, and they only need um, six more to take 50. So the odds have tipped pretty much in their favor. What that means for Indian country is that um, Maria Cantwell will be the next chairman of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee. So she'll have the power of subpoena. She'll have the power um, to set the agenda, to move legislation forward. Uh, it's a big deal. When you talk about that 50, that's the number of seats you need to shut down a potential filibuster from one side or the other? Oh, no, that's 60. Um, that's, okay. Yeah, you still need to have a supermajority in the Senate to do that. Um, but 50 is where you determine control of the chamber. So it's committee chairs, uh, all of the kind of the operating um, control of the, the body. It's still a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal because it really de makes uh, – everything shifts when the control of the Senate or the House moves around. All these committees' uh, right. faces ch uh, rearrange, and we're always looking for those candidates who at least understand Native issues. If they aren't sympathetic, at least they understand typically. Technically, that helps as well. Do you see any other races in the United States that you're looking in at that are significant to the Indian community? Uh, my understanding is Oklahoma has several candidates running this year. Yes, that's true. I, I'm actually building a map um, where I'm going to put – I think the control of the House uh, is still going to be an interesting story between now and November. So I'm kind of building a map where there's influences of Indian voters against kind of the uh, races that are up for grabs. And um, I, I think with the House – I mean, again, what you win by winning one of the bodies is subpoena power. And uh, that can slow down an administration incredibly because instead of being proactive and outdoing things, they end up defending themselves. And uh, just from a pure, purely practical point, it'd be very difficult for some of the innovations that have hit Indian country if the next two years are stuck just doing subpoenas and investigations. Uh, indeed, I remember uh, several of those in, during administrations that uh, every week they were down on another issue almost. Exactly. Let's take a look at that uh, configuration when you get it going. I'd like to do a little bit on my end as okay. well. Look, let's look at Indian country, and we're going to do some live reporting on uh, November 2nd, aren't we? We're going to check in and see if we can't do a little bit of live streaming with some of the results uh, because that configuration keeps changing, and it seems like it's time for some Native candidates uh, to be elected on this round. Oh, it'd be great. I think there's the tremendous potential. Um, I'm actually going to have a call on that in a week or two on just some of the potential out there. Okay, we're going to do another report with you in the near future. We'll get some of those candidates identified, and let's get back together and talk about it leading up to the November 2nd election. Sounds good, Paul. Thanks, Mark. Okay. And that is the latest good. roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. Miigwech for showing up and watching us. Come back again soon.